All we've heard is Dylan Cease this and Dylan Cease that this offseason for the Orioles. There are actually other starting pitchers out there, though, and a few of them pitch for the Miami Marlins. So what would it take for the O's to go that route and go to Miami and get a starting pitcher to add to the rotation? We'll talk about that with Arm Layton of Just Baseball coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles. Your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Wednesday, January 24th, 2024, and welcome back into the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and today I am going to be joined by a special guest in just a moment, but first... This episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started today. So we bring in our guest now. He is one of the co-founders of Just Baseball, which they do exactly what it says in the title. They cover Just Baseball. It's been an amazing resource uh, to add to the baseball media landscape. He is a former host here on the Locked On Podcast Network, and uh, that was of Locked On Marlins, which is why we're getting to the topic today. He is Arm Layton. Arm, welcome back to the show. Uh, thank you so much for having me on, man. It's uh, We were due for our annual uh, Marlins, Orioles, trades that will never happen sync up, but hopefully this time around, this might finally be the time. This might be the fourth straight year we've done this because I think we started when you were still hosting Locked on Marlins and then this continued on into these two teams just seem like perfect trade partners. And here we are, January of 2024, and that's where I want to start. They still seem like perfect trade partners. And besides, you know, two deals they've done, they did like the Richard Blyer trade. And then they did the Cole Saucer Tanner Scott trade, which were both before the Orioles were trying to win. And now we're here and they still haven't done a hitter for a pitcher trade. And yet it still feels like it would be perfect. I, at the first time you and I talked about this, I think Jackson Holiday was was getting his learner's permit. And, you know, it, it's it's actually crazy. But, you know, I get it from both teams perspectives. It's they've both been in unique situations, obviously much more of, of a positive track i think in, in a positive path for the orioles but you know it seems like now and i've every year it feels like we're saying this but now more than ever right it seems like this is the the best time to be aggressive but we also understand that mike elias and and this orioles front office you you know better than me I, it, they're really good for a reason but i feel like they also haven't been in a position where they could push the chips forward so i can understand where that's a little paralyzing but at some point you you, you got to go do it right you have to. And so this, you know, the name has been Dylan Cease, right? All offseason, it's Dylan Cease, Dylan Cease, because many feel he's going to be dealt, whether it's this offseason, whether it's at the deadline, and the Orioles seem like just the perfect fit there. But you look over at the Marlins, a team that is once again in flux. I mean, that's been basically the history of the franchise of the Marlins, as you know. It's that as soon as some success comes, they try to turn things the other way. We don't have to get into that any further. I'm sure it'll come up in just uh, why this is going on. But they've got a lot of starting pitching still, mm -hmm. and they need some offense still, but there's still questions about how much are the Marlins really trying to compete in 2024. But either way, these five starters for the Marlins, Edward Cabrera, Jesus Lazardo, Braxton Garrett, Trevor Rogers, and Yuri Perez. Rank them one through five for me, with number one being most likely for the Marlins to deal him, and number five being least likely, and basically the Marlins are not trading this guy. Yeah, it's it's a great question because, you know, it's something that I've kind of racked my brain on for for a while now in terms of just like what would make it I guess the, the question becomes, you know, how much do the Marlins want to get in return, but how much do they want to give up? Where do they feel like they're at? Because, of course, you give up more in terms of quality, you're going to get more. But at the same time, you don't want to communicate that to the fan base that, hey, you know, we're going to trade away our top arm. So, well, first to answer the question, then I'll, I'll explain the why. Yeah, you know, in terms of you said most likely to get traded first. Yes, I, I would put Edward Cabrera at number one, or at number one because you know I, I just think he's kind of that guy that's a little bit uh, on the outside looking in compared to some of the others. But I'd go Cabrera one. I'd go Rogers two. Then I'd go Lizardo three, and then four would be Garrett five would be Yuri Perez. And, and it sounds interesting having Garrett 
you know, less likely to get moved than a Lizardo. But when you factor in the years of control, you factor in how safe uh, a Braxton Garrett is in terms of in terms of an innings eater. And I know they just really, really like you know what he brings to the table. I think you're going to get a lot more for Lizardo because of the upside. And I think for the Marlins, they feel like Garrett's very safe. From what I've been told and, and what I've heard, it seems like Garrett's almost not even – they're not even talking about it with him. So that that seems to be the order for me. Yeah, I think the, the guys that have come up most, I think the most recent reporting from Ken Rosenthal has been like maybe teams cooling a little bit on Jesus Lazardo, thinking the Marlins want to hold him and would mm-hmm. maybe rather trade Edward Cabrera. That seems to be the, the most recent reporting, which is interesting because I think he's five years of control for Edward Cabrera. So like you're asking for a lot for a guy that, yes, yeah, still has some things to prove clearly, but people can see a successful future for a guy who's already in the bigs and has five years of team control left. Like you're asking for a lot. And, and, and the other thing for for Rogers is like he, he's coming off like kind of a weird injury season, a, a couple seasons of uh, of lots of questions. So they kind of have all their bases covered. And then you have Lazardo, where I think he's gonna he would run more than Cease. Like he's a very similar pitcher, hasn't had the year that Cease had in 2022 yet, but he's still been very good. And he has the three years of control instead of two. And this will kind of be the the, the short question. And then we'll kind of get into these guys more specifically. Like in general. Obviously, the right price has to come. But if somewhat of a right price comes their way, do you think the Marlins will trade a starter at some point this offseason? I, I absolutely do think that they, they do. Um, and, and the tough spot is, you know, I think Cabrera is kind of that perfect sweet spot in the middle where he's shown enough where a team could, you know, the right team could be a little bit more aggressive. And, and if they're bullish on him, he's, he's a little bit of a polarizing arm for several reasons. Injury history, you know, obviously the command, but the stuff is absolutely insane, as you know. And anyone who played MLB the show obviously loves to talk about his stuff, but that was actually an accurate depiction to a degree where like when he's on, I mean, it's, it's crazy, but I feel like it's when you look at also the likelihood, I feel like Cabrera and Rogers are up there and then there's a gap and then it's Lizardo. Uh, but I feel like was Cabrera just seems like the most likely to get moved here. If, if Rogers had thrown it all last year, I think the Marlins probably could have, you know, had a better chance of being able to move him. I think for the Marlins, they just feel like they'd be, selling him for 60 cents at the dollar at this point, you know, especially when the second injury that kept him out for the remainder of the year was his non-throwing arm uh, that happened, like kind of just weirdly extending for a ball that was thrown back to him as he was working back and messed his lad up. And at that point, I think they just said, shut it down. We've seen how good he can be in the past when he's healthy. And I think for the Marlins, they feel like that's a guy that's only going to build his value with Cabrera. He could get hurt again. Something could happen. Uh, I, but I do think to answer the the original question, it's extremely likely, in my opinion, that they do move at least one of these arms because they do have Max Meyer coming off of, you know, Tommy John surgery. He'll be back. Uh, They went out and drafted several arms that I know they feel very confident about uh, their ability to develop. And then they have some other options, some plug and play guys like George Soriano, who they could stretch out, who they really do like uh, as a potential five starter and and some other arms that, you know, I think they're they're somewhat excited about. So we're going to get into in a moment kind of what these guys could cost and, of course, what the Marlins are looking for because the Orioles it's probably hitters and the Orioles have a lot of those in their system. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. Now, we are well into the NFL playoffs at this point, and I know a lot of you out there are feeling pretty good right now. The Ravens hosting their first ever AFC championship game on Sunday, but you can still get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 in bonus bets, win or lose. And the app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same game parlays, and you can find bets in the new Explore tab, and you can even make your own parlay in the Parlay Hub. And it's got so much more on the app as well. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup with FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. So we are here with Arm Layton of Just Baseball talking what needs to happen for the Orioles and the Marlins to finally make a deal here. And so Arm, you've talked about Edward Cabrera, five years of control, probably number one, most likely to be moved. Trevor Rogers, three years of control, I yes. believe on him, three yeah. years. And then you have Jesus Lazardo. Probably the best pitcher right now, obviously, of the three, also with three years of control. And as you've talked about, Yuri Perez not being moved. And it feels like with them not talking about Braxton Garrett, those are probably the three guys right now. So before we get into what each of them could exactly cost, the bigger picture question is, you're saying the Marlins are most likely going to move a pitcher. What are they going to be looking for this offseason when they try and make that move? 
Yeah, so it's interesting because I think this is the first time where I actually do like what you know, what the Marlins are building from a long-term perspective, or, or at least I believe in what they're going to build with Peter Bendix. I think a lot of times it's just they haven't had that direction. It's been like sometimes it's, oh, we're going to try to win now, and that's come at the cost of being able to build something sustainable. And then on the other side, it's been, uh, you know, oh, we're going to build something sustainable and, and see what happens at the big league level. And both have just kind of been weird failures. They finally have leaned into, I think, the right approach in terms of identifying, developing, and, and I think they're going to be able to do that. But for Bendix, you know, he gets there from Tampa Bay, obviously knows that he's got to change some things up. And I think from what they want to do and what what the word seems to be is we don't want to fully punt on next year, right? They made the playoffs last year, whether you believe that, you know, it was a hundred percent, you know, earned in terms of how they performed on the field, or if it was a little bit of luck, there's luck in everything. They did make the playoffs. They're trying to build a little bit of a fan base here again. They're trying to get people interested again. I, I think it would hurt to really tear it down. So they're looking for a way where they can, you know, almost gut the house, but without fully tearing down the back wall and especially not the front wall. And I, I feel like, trying to get talent that's close to big league ready helps a ton. And, and I do think that it, it's not just trade for prospects, start over. This isn't, you know, Jeter taking over the Marlins and, you know, fire sale, tear it down, yell it for prospects and, and, and all of those things, Stanton dump the salary. I, they're only looking to cash in on assets to hedge weaknesses because I think they feel really good about their strengths, especially after drafting two of the top prep arms, you know, in, in the class in 2023 and Noble Meyer and, and Thomas White. So the answer, the short answer is bats. And I, I think beyond that, they really need help at shortstop. Organizationally, they're, they're, they're a joke at shortstop. Uh, mm -hmm. Third base is pretty rough. And then corner outfield even is pretty rough. So, I mean, you can pretty much make the case anywhere except for first base and second base. Uh, they have about eight first basemen already. And then they have other guys that probably should be playing first but end up playing second, like Luis Reyes, because they have so many first basemen. So I would say athletic infielders that you know can play up the middle and or, you know, athletic outfielders. You're telling me they're looking for infielders that are near or major league ready. You have come to the right place in oh, yeah. the Baltimore Orioles. Okay, so let's start with Jesus Lazardo. You put him third on the list. I think he is the name that Orioles fans have circled more than others, and I understand it. Again, he was, you could argue, the Marlins' best starter last year. Yeah. You could seriously make that argument with Sandy taking a little bit of a step back and then, of course, getting the Tommy John surgery at the end of the year. That he was that good. I mean, you look at his his season. You know, he finally pitched a full season for the first time in his career. Thirty two starts through about one hundred eighty innings. He had a three five six ERA. The strikeout rates were good. The walk rate was very very low. Is under three walks per nine. Like he had a really really good season. He's a left hander, which could play even better at Camden Yards. And he's got three years of control, which is one more than the two years that Dylan Cease has. And at least for next year, he'd also be a little bit cheaper than Dylan Cease as well. So. When you start thinking about, you know, the Marlins really make this deal for Jesus Lazaro, like they would have to get something serious back because they've already made the deal to go and get him from Oakland and turn him into a better pitcher than he was there. So where does it start? Because you know the Orioles system well, and people will see an episode later this week where we'll talk about that a little more in depth. But, you know, we're talking shortstop. They, they, they got shortstops. And the first person that comes to mind for me is, well, Joey Ortiz feels like a perfect fit in Miami, but it's like, can Joey Ortiz headline a deal for Jesus Lazardo? I'm not sure that can be the case. Yeah, that's the tough part. And I really think that the Marlins don't want to trade Jesus Lazardo. You know, it, it's it's a tough spot because we talk about Cabrera, we talk about Rogers. Those guys aren't going to be able to bring you in a franchise altering return. It's gonna you got to really try to to massage your way around a deal to try to make a difference and, and identify some talent that you know might be undervalued. Hard to do that in this Orioles system. Lizardo, I think the reason why they're considering it and even really willing to listen to any of these offers is because he is capable. He's good enough for you know a team in, in the right spot that really wants to push the chips forward to, to give up a player that can change their franchise. Unfortunately, and again, we're going to talk about it in the prospect episode, uh, but like I, I feel like the Marlins are, of course, going to say we want Mayo or Basayo. Of course, the Orioles should understandably say no, uh, but – you know, you have to think about the Mayo side of it and South Florida kid. The Marlins obviously want to keep Lizardo, who is also a South Florida kid and a great rep representative of the area, like goes to every single charity event he can, represents him at like Dolphins games, Heat games, University of Miami. Like there is a, a, a value beyond that that I do think is built into it a little bit as well, on top of the fact that he's just beloved in the clubhouse. Like he's just one of those guys that checks every box beyond the mound as well. Uh, so I do feel like the asking price is 
going to probably be somebody better than a Joey Ortiz because it, how could you piece it together outside of that? Maybe if you put three guys, you know, that are a, pretty close to Ortiz, or we talk about those like 50 to 55 future value guys, maybe you don't go with that, you know, top three prospect in the system. But if it's Ortiz, I think it's got to be Norby as well. And then they're going to have to probably slide in another really, really good prospect. And and that's going to hurt a, a good deal. So I, from your perspective, do you feel like the Orioles would rather go quantity? I don't want to say quantity versus quality because it's quality. Like the, the three guys would be quality, but I would say supreme quality versus quantity. Where, where do you think they're at? I think where they're at right now. And I feel like with the Lazardo talk, like it would probably be they'd want Mayo. They'd also mm -hmm. want Ortiz. You just build a left side of the infield and then some. Because they're saying, oh, we want Mayo and Ortiz, but we don't want to throw all of our eggs in the basket of two players if we're giving up Jesus Lazardo. And then you probably go down the line. You ask for probably a few more position players in a very deep position player Orioles system. The way that they seem to be operating right now is obviously Jackson Holiday is off the table. Like he's a 2024 yeah. huge piece, number one prospect in baseball. We know that. It does feel like, like teams are asking about Basayo and Mayo big time in all of these trades. Teams know that Holiday's off the table, but they're going right to number two and three. Mayo, Basayo, even if they're not going to help us in 2024, like we want them right now. And on the flip side, the Orioles are saying, even if they're not going to help us in 2024, we see them being stars a year from now. And I just don't think they're going to trade them. And I think John Angelos plays a role in this because if you feel that they are stars, stars, like I don't even think they know if Heston Kerstad or Colton Kowser or Joey Ortiz are really going to be stars, but I yeah. think they've cut it off at Holiday, Mayo, Basayo right now, they think all three of those guys are going to be stars. And if John Angelos is not even willing to give out free agent money, let alone an extension to his in-house players, you've got to be ready to continue to backfill that talent. And those are the guys they think could backfill as stars when Orioles fans are going to hate this sentence. But if Gunnar Henderson's gone after six years because they're not going to give him any money, well, if you know you have Kobe Mayo, who's already in the big leagues and you know isn't a free agent for another three years after Gunnar Henderson would leave, that really helps your left side of the infield. And so I feel like they're at the point where you mentioned just kind of being frozen in time. It might take Mayo or Basayo to get one of these true ace type Lazardo C steals done. And I just don't think the O's are going to do it. Yeah. And that's, that's the tweener spot that we're in. Cause then from the Marlins perspective, you know, I, I love Colton Kowser. I think really highly of him. I know it was a slow finish to the season. I think that the struggles in the big leagues kind of bled into that, that final month in AAA, but you know, we know what Kowser is capable of. I, I love Joey Ortiz. I think he's a, a wizard defensively and he hits the ball hard. It, it doesn't always translate into, you know, big time power output because his launch angle is like five degrees, but he's a really, really good player. Uh, but if you're the Marlins, you are a little bit unsure about what Cowser is going to be. You know, is he going to be able to hit lefties? Is he going to strike out too much at the big league level? Is he going to play a legitimate center field for you? I, I think he can do all of those things. But, you know, the fact that there are some questions, when you're trading Lizardo, I don't know if you, you could – I mean, there's always going to be questions, but I feel like there's got to be – got to be almost as confident as possible that those questions are almost background noise. With, as you mentioned, those tier one guys – uh, with a Mayo, of course, anything can happen. But with Mayo, I, I'm not that worried about that bat. That bat's going to work. It's It just will. Like, And I honestly think the defense at third's gotten so much better. So, And Basayo, I mean, this guy's going to be a top 10 prospect in baseball by midseason. So you, you have those guys kind of in their own tier. And if I'm the Marlins, I don't think I'm moving Lazardo unless I feel really darn good about at least one of the guys I'm getting back. I will say on the flip side, though, if you're getting a, a Joey Ortiz – and a Kerstad, because Kerstad, I feel like both of those guys, look, they may not achieve their their absolute ceilings, but I feel really good about both of those guys being big league contributors, you know, for the duration of their control and, and you know, not being guys that are going to be back and forth and you're trying to get them to figure things out. Like, I, I feel like they'll be contributors. How good? We'll find out. But I do think they could potentially pull off a deal if it's led by those two, because the Marlins need both of those types as bad as anything in terms of a power hitting lefty that can play corner outfield and an everyday shortstop. I mean, they're trying Vidal Brujan out there. I mean, that's it's one of those situations where the Orioles are going to be like, you really want to roll out there with Brujan? Like, you can get Joey Ortiz right now with with you know all the control you need. Yeah, it's like you, you know, I just feel like if the O's are going to make the deal, they're going to have to give up Mayo or Basayo to get at this point either Cease or Lazardo, but maybe. Kerstad, Norby, Ortiz, you throw those three names at Miami and you 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 dare them to say no. I mean, those aren't the tier one guys, but those are the tier two guys. And 
they and the flip side is the Marlins though understand that those are the much more expendable guys for the Orioles. Those are there's a reason why the Orioles would throw those guys out because there's really not a world where Ortiz is at short and Norby's at second long term for the Orioles because Henderson's at short and Holiday's at second and those are just two vastly superior players than those two other infielders. How much do you like do you think there's a give and take and it might not be with the Marlins with every team and I've had a lot of fans and and people who watch the show ask this question like are the Orioles treated like almost unfairly by other teams because a team sees the offer of Joey Ortiz or Connor Norby and they don't just take it in a vacuum. They say, mm -hmm. well, that's a great player, but we know you're only giving him up because you don't feel you need him. Give us something you need and make it hurt. Do you think that actually happens in these trade talks? It, that's actually an excellent question. I, I think inadvertently more so than like a conscious, uh, oh, I'm not going to let you get away with this just because – you know, when I'm trying to make a trade with you, I'm going to try for your best prospects, right? You're always going to start there. And how far down the line you have to kind of go to, to, to get to uh, the, the point at which we're, we're getting to a Norby and Ortiz, like you're saying no to multiple names before we get there. And I think just the very premise of that is probably off-putting, especially if, oh, you want me to trade our, you know, our, our young lefty who was, just had a career year with three years of control. And it's no, 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 yes, on the fourth or fifth prospect down the line naturally that's just not going to sit right. So I, I think that's part of the problem. Uh, and, and then, yeah, I, I do think it's on the flip side. It's like, okay, if you're the Orioles, you could always just say, if you didn't have Mayo, Basayo and holiday, you could say, I mean, Ortiz, the best guy we got, what else do you want us to give? And, and that holds a little bit more weight. So I think you have posturing both ways because you have the teams like the Marlins were in, in the case of the white Sox, they don't have to make the trade. And they could always make it at the deadline. They could always they, – they could not make it. I think the White Sox need to a little bit more, but the Marlins especially don't really have to. They could try to get creative and, you know, go try to move some arms elsewhere. But the thing is, the Marlins circle back to the O's and say, okay, we're clearly not going to line up on a Lizardo deal here because you're not willing to part with Mayo. Then how do you, how do you pivot to another deal? Because the Marlins say, okay, well, do you have interest in Edward Cabrera? The Orioles would probably say, yeah, I guess. Like he's, he's pretty good. But – you're not going to get any, you might not even get those other names that we offered you for, for Lizardo. Like you're, you might not even get Ortiz plus for that. So then now you're in this between zone. And I feel like that's why we haven't seen a deal is, is they just, they line up perfectly, but almost imperfectly at the same time, if that makes sense. Yeah. So maybe the Lizardo deal is not going to happen. And maybe between the Orioles and Marlins, once that doesn't happen, everything's off the table. That could be a possibility. But as we are representing the Orioles and Marlins here, we're going to pretend like we can still make an Edward Cabrera deal. So coming up next to finish off the show, Aram put him number one, most likely to be traded among the Marlins starters this offseason. We'll talk about what it would take for the O's to get a young, very, very controllable starter in Edward Cabrera into their rotation. So we are here with Aram Layton of Just Baseball. We are talking, you know, what's going to take for the O's and the Marlins to finally make one of these deals, pitching for hitting. And I think we we had a good conversation there about Jesus Lazardo. Like, Orioles fans want him bad. I've been trying to say, look, Lazardo is probably going to cost more than Dylan Cease. And when you get to that point, it realize, if you don't want to give up Mayo or Basayo, I don't think you're getting Jesus Lazardo. So let's go to Edward Cabrera. He's not the pitcher, at this point at least, that Jesus Lazardo is. Not nearly as proven. I think Lazardo's stuff... Well, Cabrera's got really good stuff, but maybe doesn't put it all the whole package together yet. However, Cabrera's young. He throws hard. He still has stuff, and he's got five years of control. Nothing looks better to a GM that has John Angelos as his boss than five years of team control. And that is Edward Cabrera. He's been mentioned in reports. You put him at number one. Is he, to the Marlins, more or less valuable in trade than Jesus Lazardo would be because although he's not the pitcher Lazardo is yet, obviously those years of control, the two more of them certainly play a factor. You know, I'd say less just because of um, you know, I, I think the Marlins really bought in on what, what Lazardo did. And and Lazardo, I think working with Mel Stoudemire Jr., uh, the Marlins pitching coach, like it's just been amazing how when he has a couple bad starts, like they recalibrate together and and they figure it out and, and it clicks. And again, that's why the Marlins, like when they were talking Lizardo for, for Vinny Pascantino, like that was pretty much going to be, that was the only way that they're going to do that is if, if you're getting, giving them, you know, a, a pretty much as close to proven kind of bat, you know, at that level. So I, I think they really feel like Lizardo is consistent and, and he's lost it, regained it. 
you know, he, he can kind of work through the ad- adversity now, whereas an Edward Cabrera is still a work in progress. I know for a fact, though, that Mel Stoudemire Jr. absolutely adores Edward Cabrera. And kind of whatever he says, the Marlins trust, and at least that was previously, you know, I'm, I'm sure Peter Bendix now coming back in now and, and, and getting involved has probably learned that, hey, this guy is, is just a pitcher whisperer. Listen to him. And Mel just has continued to say that he thinks Edward can be as good as anybody in that rotation, that he thinks he can be as good as, as – Sandy, even potentially with the with the stuff that he has, but there's a there's some hurdles along the way. I think ultimately, based on what the feedback is that they've gotten back, because they've floated him in the past in some talks with the Red Sox and some other teams, the feedback seems to be the volatility is just a little too much for teams to part with their top guys for. Um, at least that's what it was a little bit earlier, you know, maybe last year. So from for that reason, I, I think it makes him a little bit less valuable, despite more control. Actually, you brought up a good thing that I wanted to jump back to quickly. Was that Vinny Pasquantino rumor that kind of came out that it was nixed at the end, Pasquantino for Lazardo? Obviously, the Marlins would take Gunnar Henderson or Jackson Holiday or Adley Rutschman straight up. But beyond those guys, like, is there a current, more proven major leaguer on the Orioles that would be closer to a one for one? I mean, there's not somebody that perfectly matches Pasquantino. I mean, Mountcastle does in like position and age, but he hasn't been as proven and he has the vertigo issues and he doesn't have the, the batted ball, not batted ball profile, but the overall profile uh, that Pasquantino does. Like, is there anyone below Holiday, Henderson, Rutschman that, that, that fit that a little bit more? Because maybe the Orioles are a little bit willing, you know, to trade a, a Jordan Westberg type player, even though they're, they're kind of already solidified into the big leagues. I would say, I would say, I mean, not one for one, but I think Westberg would be that 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 guy. I think they would have a ton of interest in, in a guy like him. Um, that's a guy I've loved since since you know he was in college. But that would be the guy because he could play shortstop for them. Yeah, you know, and, and then again, just having somebody that they could they can move around based on what they add and what they need. And the Marlins look, they're going to always be bargain shopping. So if you're able to find a bargain at a position and you can slide Westberg elsewhere instead of being you know locked into one spot where okay, Westberg's deadlocked at third. We got to go find a shortstop still. It, it makes it a little bit more difficult. So I think Westberg would be kind of that way that they could protect themselves from parting with, with a Mayo. And I do think the Marlins would have a ton of interest in him too, because again, you feel very safe about what the floor is. You're getting an everyday baseball player there, right? You're getting an everyday big, big leaguer. It's probably going to be an above average one. Maybe even gives you flashes of more, but you feel really safe about that. That would be the one guy that I do think could, uh, could end up saving them and be an in-betweener because you know, he has more value than Ortiz and some of these other prospects, but may not quite have the value of a Kobe Mayo. I, I think Westberg would be that guy. Maybe it could be a, you know, you throw a Westberg and Ortiz at him and you say, you know, say no to us. It's an interesting package. That, potentially. that could work. <laughs> that, it's an interesting package. So we'll finish with Cabrera and, and what it could be. Listen, it was, you know, about 100 innings last year. 4-2-4 ERA. It, it, it wasn't the results he had in 2022 in the big leagues. I mean, that was a, that was a 301 ERA and about... 70 innings that year. I mean, we still haven't seen a, a full, full season of him at the big league level, but the, the stuff is good. He's 25. He's got five years of control. And you talked about the volatility that the teams have talked about. So is that a deal that really gets to the, the end here? Like that feels like a deal where maybe the Orioles could get away with making that move without throwing in a Mayo or Visayo, and they could try to hit on the Marlins needs, the Ortizes, the Norbies, you know, the cursed dads or the Cowsers as the headliner of that deal and then you know the mac horvaths of the world the max wagners of the world the dylan beavers of the world come into this deal as well where maybe that's something they could get done and and then there's the orioles question is something i'll talk about on future episodes which is okay if it's edward cabrera like you're not getting the proven upside you're throwing another guy in who still needs some work is that more worth it for five years but it seems like he's a guy that you wouldn't need the mayo Basayo as the the kind of top of the deal there no, I don't think so. And, and you know, the Marlins knowing that, you know, if they enter the season and, and Cabrera struggles more, or, you know, I wouldn't say more because he, you know, relatively had some good stretches. But if he struggles or doesn't take a step forward, that, that value gets hit. Similarly, how many, you know, at what point does Joey Ortiz's value start to kind of teeter yep. downwards a little bit as he gets closer to 26 years old? He has nothing left, left to prove in AAA. He's just kind of getting stale there. Uh, so it goes both ways. But, you know, I, I do think when you look at what the Orioles can offer, even if it's not their top guys, it's going to be hard for the Marlins to turn something down where it's led by a Joey Ortiz. And then you even factor in, like you mentioned some of the other names. I think a Judd Fabian might be of interest. I, I look at what you know, what the Rays have done in the past. They're not put off by big whiff 
types if they can play center field and they can run you know that's like bendix went out and got jose siri i'm not comparing judd fabian to jose siri but this is a second or tertiary piece in a deal i think the marlins would have a lot of interest there i also think that a reclamation project and reclamation might be a strong word but like a kyle stowers that guy could start in the outfield for the marlins next year uh, i still think that kyle stowers could be an everyday big leaguer so uh, being able to leverage that in a, in a situation here where those guys could play for the marlins opening day so if you're trading joey ortiz and then one of those outfield prospects, one of the Horvaths, Beavers, you know, and I know that the, the Orioles have worked with Beavers a lot to adjust the swing and kind of get it where they want it to be. But, you know, towards the end, he I kind of pushed back a little bit and said, hey, I'm going to kind of do it my way. And he raked and, you know, maybe they want to move off of him because they feel like that swing might not totally work. Like I could see that being a guy that gets mixed in there as well. So I think two of those 10 to 15 range guys in the system and then a headliner of Ortiz, I honestly think could get it done because – I don't know how many teams out there are going to be able to beat that package in a vacuum, like you mentioned earlier, where the Marlins are, you know, maybe you could get some higher upside prospects, but the Marlins made it clear they don't want to just get a bunch of low level prospects and start over. These are guys that, you know, help them still put up the, the facade of, of competitiveness. I think in 2024 still do actually help them not be a, a joke, you know, next year, if they do move some pieces while still looking at the long-term future and their potential, uh, by trying to make a move that sets them up for you know years of success. Ortiz, Fabian, Stowers, would you do it for Edward Cabrera? Yeah, I would. I really would. Um, I'd, I'd, tr I'd try to finagle a, a Horvath instead, just because I, yeah. I, I like him a lot. Um, I think he's a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, I, and I don't know what, what I know we're going to go a little long here, but I, I have a question for you. Where is the, what's the value of Stowers at, at this point? Because I know it was an injury so, year. It was a weird injury season because it wasn't all like regular injuries. You know, guy pulls a hammy, guy does whatever. Like he got hit in the face at one point and that took him out. And that, and it, it was something weird. Like it, it was very odd the things he missed time for this year. And he just, what happened was he made the opening day roster. He went two for 30 and he got sent down and he was perfectly justified in sending him down right two for 30 you're not exactly an everyday player we can get a little more value off the bench and we can give you regular at bats in triple a and try to work out of it and then he just started getting injured and once he started getting injured you know he couldn't play center field so he couldn't be the mullins replacement they signed aaron hicks hicks ended up being you know a great replacement for cedric mullins while he was injured and then Colton Kowser got the shot and Heston Kerstad got the shot. And Stowers was again injured, I believe, when Kowser was really struggling. So he just couldn't get him back up there. And we just got to the point where he still has talent. Like he still hits the ball incredibly hard, still has the ball incredibly far. He still walks despite the fact that he's got some concerning strikeout numbers, although they, they have gone down a little bit, which is good for Kyle Stowers. I just, to me, and I get a lot of like messages about like, you're not talking about Kyle Stowers. It's just like, I don't know where they're going to put him yeah. at this point. Like, you know, you got Kerstad and Kowser there and you got other guys who might start playing the outfield like Kobe Mayo to, to get them in the lineup more so. And it's just like he's expendable, but this is not the season you want to trade him after because he just was rarely on the field in triple A. So he's almost a guy where he, you know, the trades at the one yard line and a team needs another piece that they can at least put on their major league team. And the Orioles say, all right, I don't know if we're going to have room ever for Kyle Stowers. And that's why maybe he could fit into this deal if it's a guy that just, you know, punches it in from the one. You know, the, he he is giving the ball to Marshawn Lynch instead of throwing it on the goal line. And 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 that's exactly why I, I love it as a fit for the Marlins in terms of having Stowers in there because they're the kind of team where it does it does punch it in, right? Like it does make a difference. I think that's for, for the Marlins, it might almost be punching it in from the three or four because, again, he could start opening day. I'm not a big Brian De La Cruz fan. I think he gives you better defense. I do think he can end up you know, being a better hitter by the end of the year. At the very least, you have a platoon situation there. Stowers doesn't have to face the lefties. And the Marlins probably feel a lot better about that. And, and, and he's more athletic than some of the other outfielders they have. You know, Again, Fabian would instantly be one of their better outfield prospects, which may arguably you know their best, <laughs> which is – which says a lot, but, and then again, Ortiz plugs right into shortstop immediately. So yeah, do you lose some upside? Sure. But I think that's kind of what the Marlins would expect in a, in a trade of Edward. And I think ultimately they're going to shop him around, see what they can get there. But instead of just going for lotto tickets at the lower levels, let's get some players that actually help you in 24 and beyond. And I think this does that exactly. Um, I, I think it would be really hard to pass on if you're the Marlins and if you're the Orioles, I mean, 
you, you clear up that 40 spot with Stowers anyways, and they could probably use that in, in another way. And Ortiz, that, it's two 40 spots with Ortiz two, as well. Yeah, exactly. So, Great yeah. point. Two 40 spots. And then, you know, Fabian, of course, you know, you're probably interested in seeing what it all looks like when, if you can cut down on the whiff. I know the whiff really ticked up in double A. But at the end of the day, like, it's another guy that you're trying to shoehorn in there in a few years uh, if everything goes the way you think it's going to go with some of these other players. And, you know, totally different profile, actually, almost the, the, the opposite if you put him in a parallel universe. But it, it's very possible Bradfield, you know, kind of leapfrogs him, um, you know, in, in the pecking order in terms of just how quickly he can climb up to with his skill set. So it sounds like we made a deal. Well, Aram, thank you so much. Now, regular listeners of this podcast, you're going to hear Aram again later this week. But even though that's the case, let everybody know where they can find you and find your work before we let you go here. Absolutely. So you can find uh, our coverage of the offseason everywhere at JustBaseball.com. I'm, of course, talking a lot of Orioles over there because of you know, how interesting and fun uh, the team is. But then me personally on Twitter at ArmLayton8. And then check out our podcast, the Just Baseball Show. And, of course, on the prospect side, the call-up. So that was Arm Layton. He will be back with us later this week, and we are talking Orioles prospects. Just Baseball just put out their top 15 in the O system, and we will break it down coming up later this week on the pod. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.